Chapter thirty seven of the Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter thirty seven. Such was the state of things when the current affairs of Casterbridge were interrupted by an event of such magnitude that its influence reached to the lowest social stratum there stirring the depths of its society simultaneously with the preparations for the skimmington it was one of those excitements which when they move a country town leave permanent mark upon its chronicles as a warm summer permanently marks the ring in the tree trunk corresponding to its date a royal personage was about to pass through the borough on his course further west to inaugurate an immense engineering work out that way he had consented to halt half an hour or so in the town and to receive an address from the corporation of casterbridge which as a representative centre of husbandry wished thus to express its sense of the great services he had rendered to agricultural science and economics by his zealous promotion of designs for placing the art of farming on a more scientific footing royalty had not been seen in casterbridge since the days of the third king george and then only by candlelight for a few minutes when that monarch on a night journey had stopped to change horses at the king's arms the inhabitants therefore decided to make a thorough fete carillonne of the unwonted occasion half an hour's pause was not long it is true but much might be done in it by a judicious grouping of incidents above all if the weather were fine the address was prepared on parchment by an artist who was handy at ornamental lettering and was laid on with the best gold leaf and colours that the sign painter had in his shop the council had met on the tuesday before the appointed day to arrange the details of the procedure while they were sitting the door of the council chamber standing open they heard a heavy footstep coming up the stairs it advanced along the passage and henchard entered the room in clothes of frayed and threadbare shabbiness the very clothes which he had used to wear in the primal days when he had sat among them i have a feeling he said advancing to the table and laying his hand upon the green cloth that i should like to join ye in this reception of our illustrious visitor i suppose i could walk with the rest embarrassed glances were exchanged by the council and grower nearly ate the end of his quill pen off so gnawed he it during the silence farfrae the young mayor who by virtue of his office sat in the large chair intuitively caught the sense of the meeting and as spokesman was obliged to utter it glad as he would have been that the duty should have fallen to another tongue i hardly see that it would be proper mr henchard said he the council are the council and as ye are no longer one of the body there would be an irregularity in the proceeding if ye were included why not others i have a particular reason for wishing to assist at the ceremony farfrae looked round i think i have expressed the feeling of the council he said yes yes from dr bath lawyer long alderman tubber and several more then i am not to be allowed to have anything to do with it officially i am afraid so it is out of the question indeed but of course you can see the doings full well such as they are to be like the rest of the spectators henchard did not reply to that very obvious suggestion and turning on his heel went away it had been only a passing fancy of his but opposition crystallized it into a determination i'll welcome his royal highness or nobody shall he went about saying i am not going to be sat upon by farfrae or any of the rest of the paltry crew you shall see the eventful morning was bright a full-faced sun confronting early window-gazers eastward and all perceived for they were practised in weather lore that there was permanence in the glow visitors soon began to flock in from county houses villages remote copses and lonely uplands the latter in oiled boots and tilt bonnets to see the reception or if not to see it at any rate to be near it there was hardly a workman in the town who did not put a clean shirt on solomon longways christopher coney buzford and the rest of that fraternity showed their sense of the occasion by advancing their customary eleven o'clock pint to half-past ten 
from which they found a difficulty in getting back to the proper hour for several days henchard had determined to do no work that day he primed himself in the morning with a glass of rum and walking down the street met elizabeth jane whom he had not seen for a week it was lucky he said to her my twenty-one years had expired before this came on or i should never have had the nerve to carry it out carry out what said she alarmed this welcome i am going to give our royal visitor she was perplexed shall we go and see it together she said see it i have other fish to fry you see it it will be worth seeing she could do nothing to elucidate this and decked herself out with a heavy heart as the appointed time drew near she got sight again of her stepfather she thought he was going to the three mariners but no he elbowed his way through the gay throng to the shop of wolfrey the draper she waited in the crowd without in a few minutes he emerged wearing to her surprise a brilliant rosette while more surprising still in his hand he carried a flag of somewhat homely construction formed by tacking one of the small union jacks which abounded in the town to-day to the end of a deal wand probably the roller from a piece of calico henchard rolled up his flag on the doorstep put it under his arm and went down the street suddenly the taller members of the crowd turned their heads and the shorter stood on tiptoe it was said that the royal cortege approached the railway had stretched out an arm towards casterbridge at this time but had not reached it by several miles as yet so that the intervening distance as well as the remainder of the journey was to be traversed by road in the old fashion people thus waited the county families in their carriages the masses on foot and watched the far-stretching london highway to the ringing of bells and chatter of tongues from the background elizabeth jane watched the scene some seats had been arranged from which ladies could witness the spectacle and the front seat was occupied by lucetta the mayor's wife just at present in the road under her eyes stood henchard she appeared so bright and pretty that as it seemed he was experiencing the momentary weakness of wishing for her notice but he was far from attractive to a woman's eye ruled as that is so largely by the superficies of things he was not only a journeyman unable to appear as he formerly had appeared but he disdained to appear as well as he might everybody else from the mayor to the washerwoman shone in new vesture according to means but henchard had doggedly retained the fretted and weather-beaten garments of bygone years hence alas this occurred lucetta's eyes slid over him to this side and to that without anchoring on his features as gaily dressed women's eyes will too often do on such occasions her manner signified quite plainly that she meant to know him in public no more but she was never tired of watching donald as he stood in animated converse with his friends a few yards off wearing round his young neck the official gold chain with great square links like that round the royal unicorn every trifling emotion that her husband showed as he talked had its reflex on her face and lips which moved in little duplicates to his she was living his part rather than her own and cared for no one's situation but farfrae's that day at length a man stationed at the furthest turn of the high road namely on the second bridge of which mention has been made gave a signal and the corporation in their robes proceeded from the front of the town hall to the archway erected at the entrance to the town the carriages containing the royal visitor and his suite arrived at the spot in a cloud of dust a procession was formed and the whole came on to the town hall at a walking pace this spot was the centre of interest there were a few clear yards in front of the royal carriage sanded and into this space a man stepped before any one could prevent him it was henchard he had unrolled his private flag and removing his hat he staggered to the side of the slowing vehicle waving the union jack to and fro with his left hand while he blandly held out his right to the illustrious personage all the ladies said with bated breath oh look there 
and lucetta was ready to faint elizabeth jane peeped through the shoulders of those in front saw what it was and was terrified and then her interest in the spectacle as a strange phenomenon got the better of her fear farfrae with mayoral authority immediately rose to the occasion he seized henchard by the shoulder dragged him back and told him roughly to be off henchard's eyes met his and farfrae observed the fierce light in them despite his excitement and irritation for a moment henchard stood his ground rigidly then by an unaccountable impulse gave way and retired farfrae glanced to the ladies gallery and saw that his calpurnia's cheek was pale why it is your husband's old patron said mrs blowbody a lady of the neighbourhood who sat beside lucetta patron said donald's wife with quick indignation do you say the man is an acquaintance of mr farfrae's observed mrs bath the physician's wife a newcomer to the town through her recent marriage with the doctor he works for my husband said lucetta oh is that all they have been saying to me that it was through him your husband first got a footing in casterbridge what stories people will tell they will indeed it was not so at all donald's genius would have enabled him to get a footing anywhere without anybody's help he would have been just the same if there had been no henchard in the world it was partly lucetta's ignorance of the circumstances of donald's arrival which led her to speak thus partly the sensation that everybody seemed bent on snubbing her at this triumphant time the incident had occupied but a few moments but it was necessarily witnessed by the royal personage who however with practised tact affected not to have noticed anything unusual he alighted the mayor advanced the address was read the illustrious personage replied then said a few words to farfrae and shook hands with lucetta as the mayor's wife the ceremony occupied but a few minutes and the carriages rattled heavily as pharaoh's chariots down corn street and out upon the budmouth road in continuation of the journey coastward in the crowd stood coney buzford and longways some difference between him now and when he sung at the dree mariners said the first tis wonderful how he could get a lady of her quality to go snacks with him in such quick time true yet how folk do worship fine clothes now there's a better-looking woman than she that nobody notices at all because she's akin to that hauntish fellow henchard i could worship ye buzz for saying that remarked nance mockridge i do like to see the trimming pulled off such christmas candles i am quite unequal to the part of villain myself or i'd gee all my small silver to see that lady toppered and perhaps i shall soon she added significantly that's not a noble passion for a woman to keep up said longways nance did not reply but every one knew what she meant the ideas diffused by the reading of lucetta's letters at peter's finger had condensed into a scandal which was spreading like a miasmatic fog through mixon lane and thence up the back streets of casterbridge the mixed assemblage of idlers known to each other presently fell apart into two bands by a process of natural selection the frequenters of peter's finger going off mixon lanewards where most of them lived while coney buzford longways and that connection remained in the street you know what's brewing down there i suppose said buzford mysteriously to the others coney looked at him not the skimmit he ride buzford nodded i have my doubts if it will be carried out said longways if they are getting it up they're keeping it mighty close i heard they were thinking of it a fortnight ago at all events if i were sure o it i'd lay information said longways emphatically tis too rough a joke and apt to wake riots in towns we know that the scotchman is a right enough man and that his lady has been a right enough woman since she came here and if there was anything wrong about her afore that's their business not ours coney reflected farfrae was still liked in the community but it must be owned that as the mayor and man of money engrossed with affairs and ambitions he had lost in the eyes of the poorer inhabitants something of that wondrous charm which he had had for them as a light-hearted penniless young man 
who sang ditties as readily as the birds in the trees hence the anxiety to keep him from annoyance showed not quite the ardor that would have animated it in former days suppose we make inquiration into it christopher continued longways and if we find there's really anything in it drop a letter to them most concerned and advise em to keep out of the way this course was decided on and the group separated buzford saying to coney come my ancient friend let's move on there's nothing more to see here these well-intentioned ones would have been surprised had they known how ripe the great jocular plot really was yes to-night jop had said to the peters party at the corner of mixon lane as a wind-up to the royal visit the hit will be all the more pat by reason of their great elevation to-day to him at least it was not a joke but a retaliation End of chapter 37